Thank you. Thank you both for taking time out to uh, to chat all things Do Not Disturb. The film's obviously screening uh, at Fright Fest. How are you feeling about the screening? I'm excited. Yeah, I'm pretty excited too. I'm hoping... I'm hoping to actually get over there still, but I'm not sure if I'm going to yet um, okay. due to a sudden raise in flight costs. <laughs> right. Yeah. Always and the film deals with the, the toxicity and consuming nature of relationships. Where did the idea come from? Um, it's a good question because I keep getting asked it, but I literally just wrote... I was sitting in like a session I was at, uh, in what's called the Canadian Film Center at the time. And I was sitting in a session on something I don't remember, but I wrote down the words, um, honeymoon couple develops cannibal sex fetish. Um, and then I started thinking about it and thinking it was quite interesting. Um, and tying in sort of the physical consumption of cannibalism with the emotional consumption of a, a bad relationship made a lot of sense to me. Um, due to a few past experiences, both on the giving and getting end, um, and sort of examining my own behavior in past relationships in my 20s, and uh, sort of used this script to exercise my own demons, I guess. Um, and then, yeah, and then I'd spent a lot of time as a kid traveling through Mexico, so the peyote thing kind of added to that and allowed... I think allowed a level of believability to it so that the audience could relate, oh, they're not just normal people who go down and have an abnormal experience. They're they're helped by this narcotic. Yeah. And I mean, I guess it's sort of already answered my next question. So obviously relationships, there's many different scenarios where this could take place. What did, you know, why why did you decide to set this during the honeymoon? Because that's traditionally, you know, the the most lovey dovey of, of times in a relationship. That's probably exactly why I said it, because <laughs> I think it's like the time when, I mean, if and it is their honeymoon, because I think um, people travel during honeymoon, but they've had a long relationship. Yeah, it's a late honeymoon, so, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, like they've had a history, their relationship, I had to have a history in order to build up her pent up rage and frustration with how useless this man is and justify killing him, which women seem to agree to being acceptable way too quickly for my liking. <laughs> <laughs> and, and for you, Kimberly, what was it about Chloe that appealed to you? Again, I think I could relate to like the toxic relationship. And I think there was, I love the journey. I love that this woman I think many of us have been conditioned to sort of please and be nice and 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 you know to be loved and to be and Chloe's definitely battling with that and it was there's something it's just sort of there's a great feeling to play someone who just so, suddenly embraces the rage and just like completely emancipates herself to the point of like yeah chewing her her way out of that relationship <laughs> um yeah I think that that was exciting I think um and also I thought it was funny yeah I mean not <laughs> there is something funny yeah. about it yeah 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 it's the yeah. it's the Pulp Fiction shooting uh Marvin in the face type of humor yeah which I'd say the UK has really embraced and uh, much more and <laughs> and than my own country of Canada for sure but I think growing up watching Python on loop as a child has uh, sort of, I, I think British humor somehow can get bloody and it's, it's, and it's fine. And so I've never really questioned it because I kind of grew up on that, but, mm -hmm. but it is funny to now see other cultures sort of reacting to it in the way they treat it a little differently, more seriously almost. Yeah. And I mean, Kimberly, um, you know, Chloe is, she's this great role initially, you know, she's, she sort of seems meek but as the film progresses you realize that you know she's a lot stronger and it's almost I kind of felt that it's almost her own stubbornness which is keeping her in this relationship it's like I've invested so much time and energy into this person I yeah. can't leave now because I'm a failure so she's you know she's sort of just like well I guess I'm sort of stuck here I'm just wondering what you know your interpretation of her was yeah I think that makes a lot of sense that that was a lot of it and I think Oh my gosh, you get attached to someone, you love someone, you see the potential in someone. I think a lot of times you get into relationships and you see, oh, well, 
there's this and that, this man might be a bit childish, maybe there's something here, or this person is human, you know, but we'll grow together. Like you see the potential in the relationship. And like you said, you've invested so much in it at one point, you're like, let's make this work. Let's, let's, I've been in relationships like that. I could relate to, to that, you know, wanting to, and also there is love and that deception of like her not being loved the way that she wants to be loved. And, um, just like the great hope that things may turn around you give someone a second chance and then you give someone another chance and then it just keeps going until at one point yeah there's so much built up what's was the trigger to make someone well decide to put an end to this relationship and in this case you know it's helped yes by narcotics but, yeah but yeah that that was my interpretation of it as well i think you know it's well, a very real thing it is yeah. and that's that's and that's particularly why I didn't write it <clears throat> as a young honeymoon couple because I thought the stakes of all of that are also amplified and I know many people in my life who, women who get to 38 39 and they've been with a dude for like 15 years and it's like hey dude I gotta have a kid now mm. and then the dude's like no I'm not interested and it's like well fuck like you just wasted 15 years of my life <laughs> in a lot of, you know in a larger sense it's like there's there's a high stakes at that point yeah. so if that's what your your goal is yeah and the film has some very intimate moments how did you all work together as a casting crew to sort of create that safe that safe environment to be able to explore these scenes mm. a lot of communication yeah well we <laughs> we, we also had, had an intimate coordinator yeah intimacy coordinator on set who was great and she was our stunt coordinator as well yeah, she was amazing. And I think that's super helpful. And that's a new thing on sets now. Like it's fairly new to have an intimacy coordinator and that covers so much of it. There's no more of walking into like, yes, yeah, an intimate scene like that. And sometimes people, yeah, we haven't talked about all the things that you, that may or may not, that may not make you feel comfortable. And it could be when we first started talking with our intimacy coordinator, um, I didn't really know what to, t I was like, yeah, okay, I'm comfortable with this. I'm uncomfortable with that. But she went, she brought it to another level. She was like, what about grabbing your hair? Like, you know, that's something that's quite aggressive that could make someone feel very uncomfortable that you may not necessarily think of because it's not necessarily written in the script, right? And so that was really wonderful to cover all those bases. And then, and then also you just have to have, a sense of humor about it it's 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 it is awkward uh there's a lot of people watching even though it's a close set <laughs> we're all well, sweaty yeah. it's not sexy <laughs> you know you just have to be like hey you know this is it and 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 yeah just keep talking and have a sense of humor don't yeah yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. well and she's i i know like that was my first time working with an intimacy coordinator but it's really helpful because mm -hmm. it's not like it's not only like it's all of that it puts the actors very at a com a good comfort level um but it's also she's also helping with like what do you want to achieve from this camera angle and what don't you want to achieve and then she she knows how to position bodies it's kind of her job so oh, it's that, like yeah. it's really helpful so you're not wasting takes of like oh your body moved this way we can't you know we don't want to see that or we did want to see this or this and that so she's kind of great in that way mm -hmm. yeah, yeah it's it's fun and it's like yeah you got to keep it light and for a crew I think when you have like a, a 50 person crew you cut half of them out of there but for us we had 12 people or 15 people on set so everyone's kind of well, you could everyone's be. there because everyone is needs to be yeah. there but yeah. I did kick as many people I don't like people on set anyway there so there weren't that many people though, so it was cool so. yeah but every, yeah it's funny <laughs> there's some funny stories <laughs> And a lot of the film is set in in these characters, you know, in the hotel room in such a close space. How did that impact on the on the filming? Well, I think it definitely played with the claustrophobia of like creating that sense, even though like because we were shooting in this one <laughs> room, but also all staying at that hotel. So you were kind of trapped in this. Yeah, like... Kim slept above. <laughs> <laughs> we put the actors above the room because we knew that they wouldn't they'd be on set not making noise yeah, so. mm -hmm. yeah. uh but so i think that helped create that sort of like tension and claustrophobic feel uh whether we were aware of it or not like it was kind of like a swirl of 
yeah, for, personally, I felt like I, I, you know, I dove into the space and we just stayed there for the length of the shoot. And it was, that's all I did. Like, that's all I thought about it. So that was just like in that space. Um, so, yeah. It's a very large room though. Like, it's funny because it's like, if you go, it used to be a yeah, banquet yeah. hall yeah. or a conference room that they turned into a room. And then we put the bed in, the, we dressed it <clears throat> that way. Um, my wife and I, who produced, she produced the film. Um, and so she and I spent most of the week before production dressing <laughs> the set. Um, but no, I, we, I, I did the same thing in my first film, The Sublet, which takes place in one apartment. Yeah, and so true. on that one, I was very worried about finding new angles every day because you're in the same space. And in this one, Scott and I, Talked about not shooting from the same corner, so making sure that scenes moved around and didn't, when you're editing, come back and have the same angle over and over again. But also, the sort of repetitive nature of this film structure, because um, it's really the same three to five events that happen over and over again and escalate until she breaks the cycle, um, meant that we could shoot. We could use the, the same room and shoot it the same way, and I would switch it up by, at the beginning, whenever they're arguing, I've got Jack in the way. So it's always blocking what she's saying and we're cutting away from her dialogue as though he's not listening to her. And so we're doing, I'm trying to do things like that to uh, emulate sort of his disdain or just nonchalant attitude and her not being able to be heard. Mm -hmm. So that is nice because, and then it allowed us with the light to control because we're always in the same environment. We really got to know it well and there was no real if we're heading into this place, we know what light we got. We can what we can do, and and because uh, I don't like to, I don't like a lot of lights on set. <laughs> um, so it's nice. I I like that. Yeah, it was a little natural. I'm 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 excited to make a movie outside one day, um, but I do enjoy the one room. I mean, budget reasons, you stay in one place. It's nice. Mm. And the story is set in in Miami, and although primarily indoors. For me, when I was watching it, the sense of heat really does sort of like roll off of the screen. Were there any techniques that you used to uh, try and convey that? Because, I mean, I felt like I was in that sweaty room with you all. Oh, good. Yeah. yeah. Scott, the DP, Scott McIntyre, he um, he was really much more worried about that than I was. Um, in terms of making the sun coming in through those uh, windows different every single day and tracking the day so some days the sun would be here and he would change it around so that we always got a different type of light that would make sense and hit them for wherever the geography of the scene was but also made for and he would bother me every day but well, what if it's raining when we get to Miami what if it's raining when we do the outside or what if it's not morning I'd be like you can't like we don't it's nature you can't control nature man like just do what you're doing it's gonna work and then in post uh with the colorist we added uh we we really brought out sort of the orange hues within the blacks and so it adds to like the mm -hmm. the feeling of heat and we let them get sweaty that's it i, I think like a lot of times a lot of times on set you battle the heat right you have someone with powder in your face and you're trying to stay cool and you're trying to absorb and pretend like it's not hot it? film sets get warm <laughs> there's a lot of people in one place there's lights there's things you know and i think we just sort of embrace that and yeah, Kiara, our makeup artist, yeah. she really tracked the progression because they get sweatier and sweatier. Mm -hmm. see. And there was, used to be a subplot. It's not really a subplot, but a little thing about an air conditioner that didn't work. Which, yeah. in actual fact, the set had an air conditioner that didn't really work. No, yeah. But for whatever reason, I didn't even include it in the movie. Because remember, because it was the way it was set up. It was yeah. in the script. Jack's always kicking that air conditioner yeah. and complaining that it's not yeah. working. Yeah that and a splash of glycerin in your face and then you yeah luckily I don't have to do that <laughs> and uh John you mentioned in your emails that you obviously you know you shot the film on location and you even you know you brought your kids along I mean how how difficult was that to shoot a film this subject material without you know the kids getting uh interested in what in what mom and dad are up to mm. well our oldest is 12 now and he's kind of used to it I mean, my wife doesn't, her films aren't quite as bloody, um, but um, he's used to it and he just doesn't, it doesn't, you know, kids are kids. They, we sort of shield them. We didn't, we were careful about what days they came to set and what days they didn't come to set. Um, but my youngest was like, I wasn't there, but my mom took him into the special effects artist's room, Yeah. which if you happen to be a hotel cleaner, which we had, she opened the door to a room covered in 
buckets of blood and body, body parts, parts littered everywhere. And uh, but I have a picture of my son holding a human heart. He's like the happiest I've ever seen him smiling. So yeah, he's he was so excited about it. Yeah, he really dives into that <laughs> that uh thing. So it, it's when mom and dad are always watching movies. I think the kids uh, absorb it whether you try to keep it from them or not. But yeah, it was good. I, it's it's nice to like. Even though my kids were in the same hotel, I rarely saw them because I was always on set, but I would wake up before they would wake up and I would go to bed after they were sleeping. So other than him sleeping on my arm was my only experience. <laughs> or my oldest, when I'd sleep with him, he'd kick me. He kicks when he sleeps. It's not good. No, it's never good. <laughs> and we're discussing we're discussing the film in its run up to um, its, its screening in the UK at Fright Fest. And Fright Fest is a festival that covers all sort of genre films under the umbrella of the dark heart of cinema so I guess we're just wondering what each of your own personal sort of like favorite films that sort of fit under that umbrella are that's such a good question love it I I love everything I'm a bit of a vampire thing (laughs) and to me what like let the right one in was like one of my favorites like you know again like kind of has that slow build the tension Mm -hmm. and then the gore happens but it also happens sort of like towards the end and you don't really figure it out I love these types of stories um big fan of this one that one and um what about you well that ties into this film was uh Will Freakin's Bug oh yes um with Michael Shannon and Ashley Judd that one was a huge when I saw that I really sort of wanted to focus on the relationship within this film because I just love the intensity of that film and the intensity of the performances which really make that film work um but in terms of like classics it's the Texas Chainsaw Massacre is always my go-to because it's just so raw and un it's unfiltered by anything like it's just kids with cameras went out and made a movie mm-hmm. and I mean like it's it's really phenomenal that like they had no budget, no real experience. And they went out to the country, made this crazy movie that wasn't like any other movie at the time. And there's a franchise 50 years later still making money off of it. Yeah, it's it's, it's impressive. And that's another sweaty film. So I guess it's like yes. that's up at the back for, for a long time for you. It is. I tell every actor about that, actually, because one of the actors, the guy that plays the hitchhiker, he did two or three tours in Vietnam and said that filming that attic scene in the Texas heat with all the corpses was worse than any of his experience in Vietnam. <laughs> so, wow, yeah. I didn't know that. It was 110 outside <gasps> and they couldn't afford prop corpses. So they actually got ro- like real roadkill and, and it oh. must have stunk so badly. <laughs> and they spent, I think, two days filming that scene. Gee, that's going method all the way. <laughs> well, she's screaming. It's one of the best screams in cinema history. And you know why? Because she's sitting in that room. She just wants out. <laughs> Lovely. Well, back to you know, going uh, back to Do Not Disturb. Why should the Fright Fest audiences take a chance on your film? Um, well, I think I think if they're looking for something that's uh, totally different, mm-hmm. um, it's a film that doesn't use tropes but still embraces what it is as a horror film. It doesn't try to shy away from being a horror film, but it doesn't um, it doesn't fall into the same patterns that many do which I think is kind of a thing with horror films. Horror films go anywhere a lot of the time. I mean, there is the stereotypical format horror film, but horror as a genre will go more places than any other genre. And there is no, there are no rules. So if you want to see another one that is like, I think totally, I think it's a pretty unique film in that it will go from comedy to horror to drama and has a really good dramatic emotional journey at the core of all of the fun spectacle that's going on. Um, it's a fun ride. I don't know. It's a yeah. fun, and I do think it's a, I do think it's a film that would play better in a cinema when you aren't distracted by life. And I think if you allow yourself to get absorbed into it, it would, it will play better. I think all films do, but I think this one in particular that allows you to get hypnotized by some of the dance sequences and the narcotic effects and yeah, and uh, yeah, and there's a well, I guess it's a happy ending. <laughs> Yeah. It's my first film where people survive, so. <laughs> yeah, I'm happy. I'm happy you let me survive. <laughs> not to and give what, it away, but not everyone what, uh, survives. But. 
where, where um, you know, what, what projects are you both working on next? Uh, can I get <laughs> Yeah, but it's it's not okay. I have um, I've got two features that I'm sort of trying to push right now. I've got nothing financed, but I've got a feature that I was pushing before the pandemic hit and killed it. Uh, I'm gonna pick that one up again. It's uh, called She Came Knocking. It's based on uh, a short film that I made, and uh, the script was a nickel semifinalist. So I'm gonna pick that one up and try to do that. And then I've got a lower budget found footage film called The Hollywood Rejects about an actress who's fed up and decides to uh, journey across LA confronting every producer and fellow actor she feels has fucked her over <laughs> and document it for our enjoyment. <laughs> it, um, might, it might be venting my own rage with the business, but. That makes sense. I don't have anything that I can talk about right now, unfortunately, but cool things coming up. <laughs> <laughs> what I look forward to when you you know when you can share that that information with the world and I wish you both the best of luck with the festival thank you thank, thank you, you so, so much, much.